psychology and the scientific method. From the beginning, psychology has tried really, really hard to be a science. So just like physics, psychology decided the essential element of science was measurement. But measurement requires mathematics. Here's the problem though, humans don't behave as consistently as falling objects. And that's kind of sort of how the way that we are doing things was born, what we call null hypothesis significance testing. And null hypothesis significance testing, or NHST, is really just a hybrid or a mishmash of different philosophies with, with Ronald Fisher's ideas on the left and Naaman and Pearson's ideas on the right. And the basic idea behind it is that you set up a null hypothesis, which means ain't nothing going on, okay? There is no difference between the treatment and the control group, or there is no correlation between these two variables. And what you do is you gather enough evidence and compute the statistics and ask the likelihood of nothing going on, given what we have actually observed. From the beginning, methodologists protested the idea of a mechanical decision making, including a man by the name of Jacob Cohen, who wrote the witty and cunning and sarcastic article titled, The Earth is Round, P less than 0.05. But he wasn't alone. There were many, many others who also opposed NHST. So the American Psychological Association decided to say, hey, it's time to intervene, yo! Not a direct quote, by the way. Whether we should get rid of NHST. And so they assembled a task force, the likes of which we have never seen before or since, which included many of the most prominent statisticians, including John Tukey, Donald Rubin, Leona Aiken, and Leland Wilkinson. Images shown are not the real task force, but a very close approximation. And what did they conclude? Well, not much really. They recommended more graphics, more effect sizes, more use of confidence intervals, those sorts of things. But they took a very, very soft stance on null hypothesis significance testing, which disappointed a lot of critics. So now fast forward 12 years. <laughs> 2011. 2011 was a watershed year. First, Diedrich Stoppel. Just look at the guy. So Diedrich Stoppel was an all-star in psychology. Everybody wanted to be like him. I mean, look at the guy. How could you not want to be like him? Am I right? Except Diedrich Stoppel, it was later discovered, fabricated most of his results. And thanks to a couple of whistleblowing graduate students, we later learned that Diedrich Stoppel had fabricated the majority of his data for the majority of his papers, and he was summarily released. Also in 2007, or 2011, a guy by the name of Daryl Bem, a psychologist at Harvard, performed a study where he proved using NHST methodology that people could predict the future. And this paper made it in Social Psychology's top journal. Now, Daryl Bem didn't do anything fraudulent like Deidre Stoppel did. But this started to say, hey, wait a minute. If ESP can get through the publication filter, get through the statistics rigor filter, there's gotta be something going on here. Also in 2011, there was a paper published by Simmons, Nelson, and Simonson, later dubbed the P-hacking article, that identified different practices researchers engage in that makes it more likely to achieve what we call statistical significance. These practices include collecting lots and lots of covariates and trying each of them one at a time. Collecting multiple dependent variables. If the first one doesn't work out, try the second. Drop in experimental condition. Analyzing the data multiple times. After 10 subjects, after 20 subjects, after 30 subjects, after 40 subjects are collected. And you keep doing that until you find statistical significance. And so what they pointed out is that if people keep trying different analyses until something works, it's like rolling the dice. It might be unusual to get three sixes when you have three dice, but if you do it enough times, it's gonna happen eventually. So we got Diedrich Stoppel, outright fraud. We got Daryl Bem, who didn't 
fraudulate anything, and yet he published something about ESPN. ESPN. We got Daryl Bem, who also published something using the NHST methodology that people thought, this is a little crazy. And we got Simmons, Nelson, and Simonson identifying different practices that people are performing that may lead to spurious statistical significance. So Brian Nosick assembled a team and gathered 100 studies from the most prominent journals in psychology. And with his team, he attempted to replicate all 100 of them. And guess what he found? 36%. Only 36% of those studies that were originally published upon replication actually achieved statistical significance again. Oops. So where do we go from here? In the next couple of videos, I'm going to talk about the role of ethics before data collection. I'm going to talk about the role of ethics after data collection. Then I'm going to talk about the three dimensions of analyst intentions. And then finally, I'm gonna conclude with the five values of grassroots statistics. We'll see you in the next video.